Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Benny Lewis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hey everyone, today I want to talk about 21st century language acquisition. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot over the last year especially, and it's something I wanted to show you that I have learned. It's a, a process I've been going through, a, a struggle between two different points of view that I've been trying to make peace with. So essentially, um, I want to talk about merging my concepts of language hacking and modern technology and how the next generation are able to learn languages, what they prefer, with traditional academic methods and the strengths in those and how we can bring them together. So, you might know me from books, talks and travels, but before all of this, I was an electronic engineer. And I love technology. This is, when, I, when I'm taking my time off, I'm reading articles about the next smartphone coming out, or the, the latest advances in technology, or I'm reading blogs about any of those kind of things. I have a smart watch that's always telling me what I need to do, or in this case, a, kind of a time travel theme to it there. You might have seen, if you were at the Polyglot Gathering last year, I had a Google Glass I was wearing, and this is my workspace. I work with like so many different screens all over the place because I'm constantly, I want to have the best technology. I want to be ahead of the curb. So this is my personality, and that's why you can imagine there was a bit of a contrast with uh, traditional learning, you know? So, the kind of tools that we all use when we're thinking about language learning, we have all of these apps that we might spend time with, like italki is a website to connect with people on Skype or on Google Hangouts. You might use Link to help you read texts. You might use Anki to help you um, remember vocabulary, Duolingo to teach you the language, iTunes or Pocket Casts to listen to the actual podcasts about or in the language that you're learning. All of this, are th these are all things that were not available even just 10 years ago in, uh, in the case of most of them except maybe iTunes. So this is all new and we have to learn how to adapt with this new technology. <clears throat> so I'm all about in with the new, out with the old. So I'm like books, pff, who needs that? Tear up your books. We can all use Kindles. They're better, they're more efficient. And um, I've written about this in passionately on my blog. I'm like, I, I hate books. Books are physical books. No, no, no. We're going to read, we're going to do it on uh, something that you can fit 20,000 books in, in the palm of your hand. It just seems better. 20,000 is obviously better than one. <laughs> you know? So uh, this is the whole philosophy I'm coming with. I'm thinking, okay, so I also ha learned my languages in school and it did not work out well for me. I was just filled with grammar and I took German for five years, was not able to speak it even remotely at the end of that time. So don't, don't like that at all. Looking back on it, I, all I could think of were the negatives. I could just think every way that it failed me. And then I think of the new, and this is my French teacher, Lea, and I Skype her all the time. And for me, this is better than this. You know, talking with people, it's better than sitting and studying. And it's, it's just not, especially when you're somebody who loves to just get out there and like um, get into the action and talk to people and travel and go to interesting places, you're not going to necessarily have the patience. And I admit, I do not have a lot of patience when it comes to sitting down and I'm thinking about something for several hours straight. I'm like, okay, I gotta get up, I gotta do something, you know? So that is the situation. But can these older and academic methods sometimes be a little bit better? Well, let's, let's kind of think about it. So this is an older version of me, apparently a doppelganger. I didn't know. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a vampire with amnesia or a time traveler, I don't know which it is. This is Normandy 1944. True story. <laughs> so 
So the new ver <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The um, uh, newer technology, a couple of advantages will of course come to mind that you can use them quickly, you know? You can download your app right now. You can get on Skype like within five minutes and it lets you get something uh, to uh, like at least a basic spoken level almost immediately compared to um, if you think of a traditional learning method, that's not part of the, what it was made for. You're going to start learning the basics of a language. And there are, of course, huge advantages and reasons to do that. But one of the advantages of getting into something quickly um, is that you might get speaking quickly. And you can have those tiny bursts of learning. Like I was at the stage in my intensive learning projects where I would literally be standing in a supermarket queue thinking, this is like 45 seconds that I could be learning a language. So I take out my smartphone and I like <laughs> learn two or three words, you know? So these, that little burst is a lot easier. Now, of course, you could have a, a pocket dictionary, you know, you could have a, a little book, but the amounts of things you can do with a tiny smartphone in your pocket is unlimited. You could be listening, you could be reading, you could be studying, you could Skype somebody, all of these things mean that any kind of a tiny burst of learning is possible. And because it's digital, it's scalable and more affordable. The apps tend to be just a couple of dollars or free. Uh, you can get it on demand, you interact with it. Um, whereas if you think of um, print books, these are, they're expensive and they have to be shipped to you and there's time involved. So that's going to be an issue. And on top of that, it's just how people think nowadays. You think of the next generation. They're on Snapchat and they're on these things. They need to understand the tool that they're using. And if you give them a big dusty old grammar book versus a shiny new app, you know which one they're going to choose. <clears throat> so that's something that I'm always considering. I'm always thinking not just which one is better, but which one is easier for people to accept and get into? And that would make it better, even if technically it might not be as good, if people actually use it. Okay, but there are many times when the latest gizmos, the latest apps, they do not do as well as original things that have worked for a very long time. So for instance, the structured and solid kind of language learning skills that you get from attending a course with a real teacher over a period of many months where you're assigned homework um, and all of these things, you might get a certificate at the end. All of that, you can do, like I think Duolingo give you a certificate kind of thing, but it's not really the same as a university um, accredited diploma, you know? So this is something that these institutions have that you can't download, you know? You might be able to do an online equivalent, which is great, but there are many things about being physically in a space with other learners and with a teacher. And the structured process, I feel like if you do it by yourself, you lose a lot of that because I might come to a section of grammar and decide, subjunctive, pff, boring, next, <laughs> you know? And that's the problem when it's self-guided, is um, it's more fun, and I'm always encouraging people to have fun with their language, but if they are the only ones deciding what they do, they're, not, they're gonna do things that are not as fun, but extremely necessary that they have to do. Even impatient people like me, have to learn the subjunctive. As much as I'd, I, I'm like, no, where's the subjunctive app? You know, <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work like that. I, I, got, I got to sit down, I got to do exercises. I have to patiently listen to a teacher explain it to me if I, if I don't understand it. This is where uh, the kind of classroom environment wins. And it's also more trustworthy because on the internet, you don't know who you're dealing with. So this is me teaching um, in Salamanca. I taught all of these students and this school hired me because 
I had a certificate in teaching English and I had my resume that showed that I worked for Berlitz and Wall Street Institute. So the parents who were sending children to those schools knew that I was at least a good teacher. Maybe not the best teacher in the world, but at least they knew I was trustworthy. I had this kind of background. That's a lot harder on the, uh, when you're doing things on the internet because the internet does have a lot of like shiny GIFs animating, showing like a, um, a weird looking certificate or a medal and you're like, oh wow, that looks legit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and like you could do that in, in like you can uh, Photoshop it in a few minutes. You can pretend to do things. You can exaggerate your achievements. The internet is not the easiest place to get genuine information about how trustworthy something is. You know, it's getting better, there are ways it's improving, but ultimately there are a lot of schools that go into the kind of uh, time involved to make sure that they, they vet their teachers and that you can trust them, or they, they vet their courses and they only use courses that have gone through many years of research and so on. So, these older methods, traditional learning, win that way because they're trustworthy. And it's also just required. There are some rules, like here's two rules I was breaking. I don't actually smoke, but I couldn't resist this photo. <laughs> it's like literally no uh, smoking prohibited and dancing prohibited. So it's like, oh yeah, I'll show you guys. So, <laughs> the, well, the, I mean, obviously I just wanted an excuse to put that photo up there, but the, the point is, there are rules that you do need to follow. You, you need to have a university accredited or a college accredited degree to get a lot of jobs. And that is the way the world works. There, there are processes you have to go through and you cannot skip a lot of these just by doing it online. You can't, there are excellent examples of people um, having great success without going through those systems. You, all, you can always think of like Bill Gates didn't finish college and there's so many examples, but using that as the rule of thumb is not a good idea because you do get a lot of great life skills in a university, not just what you're learning, but you learn how to, how to cooperate with people. You learn all these, these teamwork. You learn about bureaucracy, the annoying, boring parts of traditional learning are parts of life. And if you skip those and just say, I'm gonna download everything, then when you finally get a real job and you have to deal with bureaucracy, you're like, where's the bureaucracy app, you know? <laughs> so that's just the way the world works. And going through that system makes people stronger for the real world. So in learning this, I have tried to combine these because for the first like five or six years of my travels when I, I, I had been let down by my school learning I did not reach any kind of useful level of the language I'd studied and I tried traditional methods when I started learning Spanish and it didn't work and then I tried to do more fun things like I started learning via websites and I started just speaking immediately with very little structure. So I did all that and it worked to get me up to, you know, basic conversational level. And I was very, I was, I was pleased with that. I was like, yes, good for me, that's great. But it kind of stopped me from going further because with a lot of lack of structure, you get your momentum quickly. You get the confidence quickly but you do not get any kind of deep understanding of the language because like I was saying before, some things are not as much fun and are extremely necessary. So as I started to learn this, I realized I needed to start looking into language cert certification. So I've sat a bunch of the um, Seffler exams, the Goethe Institute, which I didn't pass that one, but it was still a good experience. I did pass the uh, one from the Instituto Cervantes and the Alliance Francaise, and I prepared for the Celli, the Italian one. So all of that made me see things that all of my disorganized, unstructured learning before 
had not shown me all of this process of like, I'm preparing for an examination, I had never worked on my writing skills. I had not really been good at reading because that I talk about it all the time. Oh, speak the language, speak the language. So obviously I did not get good at doing anything but speaking the language. But these courses have several different sections in them that mean you will not do well in the exam unless you can do well in each of those sections. So I learned this is something that I just need to sit down and do the hard work for. So after that, I've also learned, okay, instead of saying, down with the system, they're all evil, I have learned I need to work with these kind of institutions. So I've done a lot of work with different universities. Um, and I've helped them with their course development. I've advised them, I've spoken at their, um, like the University of California, San Diego, run the MOOC, Learning How to Learn. And they invited me to be part of their opening module, which I, I was very honored to, to be a part of. So instead of opening the module by saying, universities are a waste of time, <laughs> I, tr I started to see this is what we need to do. We need to work on these two things together. And as part of my attempts to merge these things, I started working with Teach Yourself. So I had used the Teach Yourself courses over many years when I was ready to get a little bit more structure because you have to do some kind of, here's unit one, here are the questions, uh, here's some audio to listen to. You have to do that if you want to have a very good level in the language. So I would start by just Skyping, speaking, going to places, and just like getting some kind of haphazard basic use of the language, but then I would use the Teach Yourself courses or other courses, and I would use those to help me get that structure. So when Teach Yourself reached out to me, I thought this was an excellent opportunity for me to do something on a much grander scale, to try to see if I could go from the inside out and try and change those courses to include some of the stuff I said at the start, some of the new technology, some of the fun and all of these other things while not removing the best parts of courses that really should be there. So that is what I have been doing for most of the last uh, year, year and a half. And these four books are coming out in September based off that. And I say it's the best of both worlds because we combine a few things. So I'm all about speak from day one. It's my mantra that I start learning the language, I know 20 words, I will use the hell out of those 20 words. <laughs> I will somehow manage, I always joke to people, actually uh, guest posted uh, uh, like, um, with other people on Steve's blog recently, and I told them that my, one of my first eureka moments was with Spanish, after I had failed to learn it for six months. Um, I started this experiment where I, I would speak Spanish every day and stop speaking English. So it was kind of a precursor to speak from day one. And, one, and it was very frustrating and I wasn't really getting anywhere because I didn't know how to do it well. And then one day, an electric toothbrush that I had just bought, brought, bought the day before broke. And I was furious, I was so broke back then. I had like next to no money. So even though it was like 12 euro for a crappy toothbrush, I was, I was like, I, I, I demand justice, you know? <laughs> You know, the, I can't deal with it. So I went to the supermarket. I stormed in, ready, ready to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a customer. You need to treat me with respect. And I was like, I don't know how to say toothbrush in Spanish. <laughs> or refund. <laughs> or broken. <laughs> so that moment, I, I could have, like, I think if I had been structured, I would have thought to myself, I, ha I have to stop, look at a dictionary, look up these words, maybe research. How do you... Uh, situations where you ask for refunds in business establishments, you know? <laughs> <coughs> I didn't do that. I just stormed in, and that forced me to have that eureka moment because I was like, uh, diente machina. <laughs> uh, bueno, no, um, uh, dinero, ida y vuelta. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It worked. It worked. It actually got me my money back. That Tarzan Spanish of like a uh, money round trip somehow led to me getting my money back. So I found 
speaking from day one means something. It is a useful part of language learning. It is not for everybody. I would absolutely say that. There are people who would not find it useful for the reasons they're learning a language. But if you really do want to be speaking with people, I, as one of your pro main priorities, I would encourage you to speak earlier. But how can I do that in a course? How can I have a print book do that with people? Partnering with italki. So while we have the unit structure, we also have every unit working towards getting people to use this site and Skype with other human beings. So when they're face to face, even digitally, with another person, they're gonna, and I'm constantly saying, as well as teaching them things they need to know, I'm also saying it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay if you don't know how to conjugate the verb. Just say something. But doing it in a way that lets them to kind of follow a process, because the advice, just say something, you can't take that and have six months of learning based off those words. You know, a little bit of structure and a little bit of guidance help. But we combine it with italki, so there are real humans in the course that will help you. What about making it more personalized? So if you look at this, there's something you might notice about me. You like Star Trek. I, I, I kind of like Star Trek a little. I imagine it's Batlek. So I am a Trekkie. You can see I've got like an autographed picture of all of the next generation. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> Met the, the, the late and great Leonard Nimoy and hung out with uh, Ferengi Borgs. And of course, I speak Klingon. A little bit. <laughs> Not very well. So this is something about myself that I might, I might want to talk about when I meet somebody. Maybe it might be the most important thing for me that I, I'm like passionately I want to talk about. There is no course in the world that's going to have how to tell people about your Star Trek um, fanboyness. you know? <laughs> that's not going to happen. And that's always been an issue I've had with courses that they're telling me how to say, where is the supermarket? And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I'm not going to talk like that. That's not why I'm learning the language. I might go to a language exchange event, and I want to get to know that person. I want them to get to know me. I, I want to make a friend. So all of this kind of touristy stuff of how to get to places, it's not as necessary for me. But of course, I cannot possibly make a course that has every possible uh, discussion for every unique person. So I tried to make a course that had the structure while letting the person fill it themselves. It's a course that they contribute to, that they decide how to use which words, and we tell them how to find those words. We say there's a list of online resources where they will be sent to word reference. If they want to look something up, they'll be sent to other places because I can't possibly make the book, uh, the course, perfect enough to be able to teach people every word. But why would I need to when, like I said, we have technology? We, can, we have apps. We can tell people, use this other stuff. And I feel like that is a main drawback of a lot of courses, is they try to make themselves the exclusive means that somebody can learn a language. They try to from a marketing perspective, say it's the best way to learn a language. And I think it's a lot better to try to think of the ideal course as being the best guidelines, the best template, the best rule of thumb, and that kind of thing, the best guide to learning a language. So the people become stronger, independent learners, while still having a little bit of that structure. And then, of course, it's a printed book which, as you saw, I was tearing up. As soon as I announced, oh, I'm publishing books, they were like, Benny, you hypocrite. You wrote uh, that how books are evil. And I have actually, be, I, um, when I was contacted by my agent for Fluent in Three Months to print it, I turned them down, and he had to spend a year trying to convince me. Because I kept saying, no, traditionally published books are not a good idea. Ebooks are the future. But he told me something that I did learn was true, that I have, I have gone on a very extensive book tour, and I have met a lot of people who depend on bricks and mortars bookstores. 
They walk into those places, they see a book on the shelf, that's how they get their information on the world. So the internet is a fantastic place. It's getting better and better. More and more people are connecting. But for the next few, at least the next decade, there will still be a lot of people who get the vast majority of their inspiration and learning from traditional methods. And that's what inspired me to publish a book, to get to those people. These are people who are not going to stumble upon any of our YouTube videos or any of our blog posts. They're not, that's not what they do. They check Hotmail once a week. And that's, that's what they use the internet for, you know? So I wanted to try to get through to those people. And that's what the advantage of a printed book is. But, of course, the online part needs to be an aspect of that. So I merged it with an online community that people can ask questions, they can be interacted with, that the book, I might want to update it, like we'll have reprints, I'm sure, in a year or two, but there's still things I might want to update. I might want to say, oh, this is new website that will really help you with this thing. And I can't exactly run around the world and like writing an extra like two words in every single page, but I can click a few buttons and update a website where I'm telling people in the book, make sure to check out the resources. And anytime something comes up, look up a word. Don't forget, we have good dictionaries in the, in the resources. So we keep expanding on that. Maybe word reference might go down one day. You never know. So obviously, I want to replace that. So we were very careful to make the book as evergreen as we could and leaving it so that all the best resources would be in its connected online edition. And of course, it's an established course. Teach Yourself is owned by John Murray Learning, who were the publishers of Charles Darwin's Theory of Evolution. So this is an extremely experienced publisher in helping people learn, in spreading education and important information. And this is a picture of their, they call it the Darwin Room, where they hold a lot of their classics. And you might recognize the old style teach yourself books from like the 60s and 70s. So that's great about courses. They have that established concept. They, are, they have the time that they have been doing this for many decades, which none of us can possibly compete with. No matter how many YouTube videos we upload, we're still not going to have as much content as these guys. But there's something about courses that they don't have that we do on the internet when we upload YouTube videos and such, is it's not personal. There's no, you don't feel like there's a person, like there's a, an author there, but you don't have that extra touch. So we, <coughs> oh, I forgot to upload a picture. There was a, a um, I took a picture of one of the pages in the book that what we try to do is give it that personal edge. So there's like the course in the main part, but then in the margins, there's this handwriting, you know, a little like squiggly arrow pointing somewhere. And I'm like saying, oh, don't worry too much about that. It's not a big deal, you know? <laughs> and I, I get to do that. And I had so much fun that I could like teach a, a grammar rule that you need to teach. You, if you do not teach it, then you are failing your students. But then I could still add my opinion. So anytime it's an opinion, it's in like clear handwriting, where like I get to be like, yay, I can say subjunctive. Ah, uh, you can worry about that later. Just know it's this thing, and you'll get to it soon. And if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. And that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to take that structured course and inject some personality into it. So <clears throat> that is what I have been doing with um, combining the two things. So I wanted to wrap up with a suggestion for how we could keep up with trends. So for instance, I've been looking at the 360 videos a lot. So I don't know if you guys have had any experience with this. It's the most fascinating thing. This is a Google Cardboard. And it's something that you can get for $10. Or for $5, you can make it yourself with the right pieces of cardboard and little pieces of glass that you could put into this thing and fold it up. And then you slot in your smartphone. Doesn't matter what, what it is. Doesn't matter if it's a $100 Android smartphone. You slot it in. And then you open up uh, you, the YouTube app. 
and you select 360. There's a search option that lets you tick a 360 box, or you go into like just search for 360 videos. And that splits the screen into your left eye and your right eye. And you put it in the box and you actually have an immersive 3D experience of whatever you're looking at. So um, instead of the $10 one, I got, I got myself a $30 one. And this is not, it, all of this is, is like a, an empty case. And you put your smartphone in it, put it on, and before you know it, you're there. So the, the thing about this is you look left, the video is playing, and while it's playing, you are in a perspective inside of the video, and you're looking around at what is happening. You are in a virtual immersive environment. So I have been so excited about this because I see so much potential for language learning. I see a lot of immersive experiences that you can uh, tie in, and I see ways that people can try to understand what it's like to speak a language by putting themselves in front of somebody, not just on a screen, but like genuinely feeling like they're in a room or that they're in the mountains in Peru or whatever it is. These things that give the language context because that's something I feel that definitely was missing when I learned German in school is there was no context. It was just this language that I had to learn to pass an exam. And I, I didn't actually imagine human beings actually spoke this language. You know, it was just a thing that existed on paper. And this is something that a lot of beginners in schools who don't care that much about it, don't really get to appreciate. So this is something I'm kind of trying to think, okay, we could tie that in with traditional learning. And this is something that they're doing in schools now, is they hand out all the students these little $5, like they get the students to make them themselves. Bring in lots of cardboard, little pieces of glass, whole thing costs about $30, and then spend two hours doing a creative kind of cutting it and putting it all together. And then they put little smartphones in and they get to experience what the teacher wants to show them, whether that's uh, geography and going to the Grand Canyon or interacting with um, a group of students across the world in some way. So these are, this is something I'm looking at and I'm thinking, how can we take this cool technology where people can like pretend they're in a roller coaster, which is fun but not really useful, and then combine it with stuff we know that works. Interacting, a teacher telling people how to uh, use the app so they can get into things. And this, this is something I want us to think about with language learning, is, is not let's be traditionalists and remember that the old system is the best and not let's just abandon everything old and take on the new, but combining the two. And uh, the last thing I should say um, that I think is a good thing in uh, the, the course, the stuff that I've been trying to do is I am an extremely chaotic person. This whole presentation was not ready at 11 o'clock. I was still like, oh my God, I'll do it last minute. That's the kind of person I am. I am messy and chaotic. My partner, Lauren, is a perfectionist. If you read my blog post, I'm like, down with perfectionism. It's the antichrist of language learning. And that is like my opinion. It's, how, it's my method. But there are opposing methods. And doing that in a course would be a problem. If you had a course that followed pure imperfectionism, there would be countless mistakes. I'd be like writing it up and thinking, yeah, it's good enough. They'll, they'll get the gist of what I mean. Publish, you know? <laughs> But that's not the way it worked, because I would do that, and then Lauren would come in, and she has, when I met her, she was doing a PhD in rhetoric. <laughs> so she knows a lot of structure, and she applied that to the course, and that kind of, as it was growing, so rather than me make a chaotic course that an editor come in and just be like, oh my god, these author morons I have to deal with. <laughs> Instead of that, it kind of evolved the right way from the start. So. That is what I want to talk about, and I would love to take your questions. Thank you, everybody. OK. Yes. Sure. download and not being online all the time. 
Yeah. Yeah. This is something. Yep. This is something I'm extremely interested in because I did my undergraduate thesis in something called trellis code modulation. That's when you take data and you try to make it more efficient by removing redundancies and so on. And one aspect of that is taking something very complicated and making it work on a lower bandwidth. And this is something that, like JPEGs, are for instance. JPEGs are what would be an extremely large file of like many megabytes that would take a very long time to download if you're on a slow connection, and it squashes it while keeping the information the same. So there's a lot of ways with um, the development of VO VOIP technology, for instance. You could still Skype people on poor connections, and a lot of um, systems I've started to see are concentrating on that lower end of the market, and especially because of how technology is changing in developing countries, they are focusing on that gap. So there are people writing code in Africa that, that deals exclusively with how to process low bandwidth connections. So that's, that is something that is definitely happening. It's something I'm always looking into. Anytime I see new technology, I always think, yes, but how will it work in poorer countries. And that's why the Google Cardboard for me is amazing because you just need a piece of cardboard. You do not need the, the vibe, like an $800 headset that you have to put on each person. So I, I always like to imagine how does that work. And in these courses I, I've been uh, working on, I'm actually looking ahead and I want these, like I'll do a big promotion, hope they sell a lot and the bookstores take them seriously so that in the next set, I can start making courses for immigrants and I can get them translated for like the Syrian immigrants who want to learn German. And I want to consider that other perspective because I've spent a lot of the last 14 years in places with terrible internet, with people who do not have a lot of resources and a lot of money, and they don't have access to English materials that explain how things work. So I'm extremely aware of those kinds of perspectives. But you can do a lot of this offline. So the, um, I mean, you have to pay $10 for it, but the YouTube has a YouTube Red subscription that I'm a part of. And because of that, when I'm in the app, I can press a download button. So I actually have 360 videos downloaded offline. And I went to Lauren, my partner's parents, who live in the mountains where I don't get any cell phone reception. And I still showed them YouTube 360. I was like, oh, put this thing on and press play, and they were looking around. So there are a lot of ways you can download things offline, and a lot of the apps are letting us do that. There are features in like Memrise that let you download to go through it offline. So I think like I'm, I'm always trying to consider that when I see an app, I'm thinking, how can this work in this situation where people maybe don't have a 50 megabit a second connection speed? And maybe they can't afford to get this $600 accessory, you know? And I'm very glad to see that there are ways to make that work. So I hope that kind of uh, answers your question. Yeah? OK. Anybody else? Yes? Um, do you have any hope that um, the education system, and I'm, I, I don't know much about other uh, outside of English speaking countries, but uh, there's a lot of people go through primary, secondary school, like for instance in Canada, English uh, speaking students learning French and they don't end up speaking French at all at, at the end. And like I'm sure the situation is similar in Ireland with people learning Irish. Yeah. Do you have any hope that that will ever change? Yes, I do. Because when I was learning Irish in school, yeah. the material they gave us, it's, it, I felt like I was being punked sometimes. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm a teenager, I'm even more impatient than I am now. And they give me a book in Irish about this old lady in the 40s and how crappy her life was. 
So you can imagine how, how fascinated I was at the idea of spending hours reading that book. But just 10 years later, and that, that reinforces the idea that Irish is a dead language, that you, do, you should not learn it. So that, that's kind of the background people in Ireland are coming from, where we are, we are just getting constant proof that we do not need to learn this language by the people who are trying to teach it to us. But a few years later, I turned on my TV and I saw SpongeBob SquarePants in Irish. <laughs> and then other cartoons in Irish. And then movies in Irish. And there are videos on YouTube in Irish. And if that kind of stuff, because at the end of the day, in my free time, I would watch like TV shows and I would go on the internet or whatever it is. That aspect of the language wasn't shown to me. Now, of course, in French, there's, there's a billion things that you can do just like you can in English. But how much exposure are people getting for that? And so, um, like, around the time that I was seeing Irish uh, SpongeBob SquarePants was on, I was teaching that class uh, in the picture I showed, and I asked them what they're interested in. And instead of making the class about, well, I like travel, and I like language learning, and I like technology. So I'm going to make a class about RAM and gigabytes to this like, group of nine-year-olds. I asked them what they liked, and they actually told me some computer games they played. And I went in, I researched, and I had to teach them prepositions. It was part of the curriculum. But I teach them prepositions. Like I forget what game it was, but let's say it's Mario Kart. I would be like, um, the, the shell was thrown. Hmm? The Koopa, and there would be, it was thrown at. And I was like, good job. So I gave a context that was relevant to them. And one of the issues that I see, at least in the English speaking world, is when we learn languages in schools, it feels extremely irrelevant. It feels like we are teaching, that we're, we want them to, we're like so many steps ahead. We want them to be like C2 level speakers who can discuss extremely detailed topics. And so that's how we teach them. We teach them how to talk about politics and, you know, um, difficult issues and writing applications for jobs. And that's the wrong way to do it, in my opinion. I think we should teach them how to use the language like they use their mother tongue. Their mother tongue. And then they'll actually be interested in it and they will feel its relevance and they'll get the momentum that will then let them write job applications and so on. So um, it's, it's interesting because I've had an opportunity to see the reverse. When I was in Amsterdam, I was invited to a secondary school. And they, they were using English to, to do fun things. They were, the teacher was speaking in English to the class. I did not get that in German when I was learning it in school. I was taught German through English. So it just removed the context that it exists as a means of communication. So I think that's the kind of thing missing. That's why when I was making this course, I was like, if I wanted to talk about Star Trek, would this course facilitate that in any way? If the answer is no, it wasn't good enough, you know, without actually talking about Vulcans and the space-time continuum and all that stuff. So that, that's kind of something I, I feel if a teacher is teaching a class, they should be thinking, what did these students do for fun? And I, you don't have to make the class about going laser tag or something. You just have to think, what, you know, how can I incorporate that theme into what we're talking about? So that's my, my thoughts on that. Yes? One more question. So I wanted to know how differently you're going to market these books that are coming out. So you did a book tour what, two, three years ago. And you were in the media. You did in, in bookstore talks probably other things I don't know about. So what was successful there? What surprised you? And what, what are you going to recreate this time? Oh, um, what was successful? Or what wasn't successful? What was, what was successful would be the, the local uh, focus. So like initially, my instinct was I got to like talk to TV stations. And I got to be in like, the fr I have to be on the front page of the New York Times or something. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And not only is that extraordinarily like, optimistic and it will lead to lots of disappointment, but um, it's a lot easier to do the smaller newspapers. And the, um, the interaction for the amount of readers is a lot more. 
So maybe a newspaper has 20,000 readers, but it has 20,000 people who genuinely, at least like 60% of them, are going to go through and maybe see your article and genuinely think about it. So that's kind of the, the local focus is uh, what I've done. And try to see communities that really need it. I always tell people the way I gave my first TEDx talk, i had never spoken in front of a crowd in my entire life. So even something like this, I had never done that until the TEDx talk. So I had no experience to show them. But what I did was I found a TEDx in a community that I knew needed language learning more than anything. And that was San Antonio, Texas, because it, had, it has the largest <laughs> Hispanic community of America that does not speak Spanish. So I find those little kind of gaps, ways that I can not just go to somebody who's minding their own business and say, hey, you, learn a language and tell others to. You find people who want to be found. You find people who, who have that missing need and try to give it to them. And one thing I'm doing differently this time is we're going to be outreaching to a lot more academic uh, institutions, a lot more universities. Um, Teach Yourself said that they are going to be partnering where they give like a, a special cheaper price for universities and schools if they consider adding it to the curriculum. When we designed the course, we had to take that in mind. So I had to consider that I couldn't give any adult jokes in the book, <laughs> or I couldn't imply that drinking is cool or anything like that, you know? <laughs> so like all of that stuff, we, we actually designed it so that it would work for a larger audience space, so that when we come to the marketing stage and publicity, that it would give other places a chance to consider it. So um, yeah. Uh, so I think that's uh, the time we're out of. I'm going to be, after lunch, I'm going to be out in the hall, be happy to take some more questions. And I got um, uh, not these books. You can find them on languagehacking.com for pre-order. But I have uh, Fluent in Three Months in multiple languages. So um, I always tell people, like, I try to figure out the different titles and everything, and it's uh, a lot of fun. But otherwise, great talking to everybody. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it.